So we talked about inverse functions. We talked about exponential functions. Today, we're going to talk about the inverses of exponential functions. And this is arguably one of the hardest things to do in this class. And I think the reason behind it is that the notation we use when talking about the inverse of exponentials is like reading an alien language. And it's, very, it's not intuitive at all. And so what I want to do is try to make it as intuitive as possible. And I want to start by doing what we're going to do with exponential functions. I know, buddy. I'm sure that hurt. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You got to be careful when you're climbing. You got to be careful. We're going to go through the, a function that you are very familiar with. We're going to talk about its inverse, and we're going to see how the notation we use, it's that we're going to reason by analogy. I'm having a hard time concentrating. We are going to try to work by analogy because there's also some interesting notation in there, but you're just so used to it now that you are not, um, that it doesn't seem as alien but you're gonna see that it's this, the same game that we've been playing all along. And hopefully by doing this, it will help to get us around this weird notation that we use. We're gonna start with this function right here. Here's my x-axis, here's my y-axis, and we are gonna look at the function f of x equals x squared but we're going to restrict the domain, meaning we're not gonna take negative numbers in this case. We are gonna pretend that the domain is just from zero up to positive infinity. And so when we do that, let's just plug in some values and get a picture here. I plug in a zero, I get out of zero. I plug in a one, I get out a one. I plug in a two, what do I get out? Uh, four. Yep, because two squared is four. Let's get one more. I plug in a three and I get out what? Uh, nine. Nine. All right, and so this is our old friend, the parabola. And it's the parabola that is based there at zero. That's, that's nice, OK? Now, one thing I want to do, what I would like for you to do right now, because I want you to believe this. This is where you're going to use your sheet of paper and a marker. To redraw this on your sheet of paper, just like I'm about to do right here. It does not have to be perfect, but we do need our x-axis labeled with an x, our y-axis labeled with a y. Mm. The curve just make it look nice. And we do want to include those four points right there. I want the point at zero, zero. And you'll notice I drew this funky and my one is not going to look like the one. That's fine. I'm going to put a big dot there and match up a one with a one. I'm going to do this for two and this for three. Put a big dot there and match two with four. Finally, plug in a three, get out a nine. So I'm going to put a dot right here. Let me know when you got that bad boy. Okay. Okay. Now, what we want to do is find the inverse of this function, but let's not 
think analytically at all. Let's just look at the graph. All inverse means is used to be the case that I would take some value X. That would be the input. We do something to it and we would get an, a number as an output. And so it used to be the case that I gave you a three, you would do some stuff and give me a nine. And so now what we want to do is play the game where we say, well, if the output was four, what was the input? And we're talking about that. In other words, it's the reverse game where we swap X's and Y's and we get this. So now what I'd like you to do is flip this guy over and trace over what we just drew. And do not rename X and Y. Because that's kind of what we had been doing. But let's keep X and Y as they are. So Y now should be the horizontal axis. So in other words, what I'm saying is we're not doing any kinds of tricks. We are literally just looking at the other side of this coin. And so I'm going to mark exactly what these things were, just like that, a one, four, and nine on the bottom. Wait. Okay. Could you? Yeah. So remember how we did this before, right? It can't be. We need our Y's to go positive and our X's to go positive. And so the only way to do this is to flip this this way over the line. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so now I have my positive Y's going to the right and I have my positive X's going up. And I'm tracing oh. over the graph. Like that. And we still have all the same numbers, correct? All the, yeah, the numbers are the same. As all I'm doing, I'm literally looking at the other side of this. It is the exact, the exact hey. same information hey. that we started off with. Hey. We're just hey. orienting it differently. Hey. So there's nothing different hey. between these two things. They are exactly the same information. We're just thinking about it a little bit differently. And so let me know when you are done with your opposite side of this bad boy. Okay. Okay, so. Now, what I'd like you to do is as we move on in this for this, what you're going to want is to have this drawn on your notes, not not on your piece of paper. This is this is for you. You could frame this if you want. No, I on, on your notes, you should have this drawn and then next to it, let's draw the inverse of it. So and the only reason we did this was just to really drive the point home that this information right here that we started off with is exactly the same thing. There is no difference between this right here and this right here. It is exactly the same. We're literally just looking at the opposite side of the coin, right, as it were. We're saying it's the exact same stuff. We're just representing it differently. And so let's get both of these drawn. The Y is on the bottom, X is on the top. It goes like this, plug in a zero, get out a zero, one, get out one, plug in a Right, let me double check, make sure I did this right. One, two, three, four, nine. Yes. I had an entire physics lab based off of these equations. Yeah. A few weeks ago, and I had no idea what the heck was going on. <laughs> Fun. That sounds like physics. I had no idea what the heck was going on. That's physics. That is mm -hmm. physics. Okay. So. You got this? Yes. Now, just like I said before, this is, this, this is exactly the same thing. But like I was saying before, we could play the game of inputs and outputs backwards. That is, I gave you some number to plug into this function. 
You plugged it in and you got out as an output, you got nine. And now the inverse game is saying, well, where did it come from? If nine was the output, well, and then we say, well, it must have come from the number three. But that itself is a function, right? And I could say, well, that's, you gave me an input. You said the input was nine. And so we're saying, okay, so nine is my input. And now three is my output. Literally, we're just thinking of the, the old game we played, but just in reverse, right? Now let's bring symbols into the mix, right? And as a matter of fact, we could call this thing right here F inverse, because that's what it is. We could say F inverse of, we could call it Y, because Y's, and I'm trying, I'm doing this on purpose. I'd like at this point before, we swap the roles. We said, well, your inputs, we always call them X. This will be nice so that we realize to think about it like this is to say, well, hold up. It's not just any old input. This thing in order to go in has to be an output of this. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense, right? Like if I were to say, I put some number into here and got out a negative four plus seven I, that never happened. You can't do that. It's not, this does not work. We have to have numbers that were actual outputs to go into this thing. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes. Like I can't say, well, what about a uh, negative five? Well, negative five is not an output. So you can't put that into the inverse. And so that's kind of why, I'm, why I wanted to keep this letter right there as a Y, so that reminds us it came from somewhere specific. This was an output of this thing. And since we're talking about that, why don't we just rename this thing Y? Y equals X squared. And now what we've done is we've said, well, this is when you take these guys here, treat them as inputs, we take three and we square it. It tells us to take it and multiply it by itself, gives you the new output y. So now what we're doing is given a y, we want some formula for x. And I'm just going to do this. Well, let's just solve this formula for x. What do I need to do to, to this equation to get x by itself? Uh, take the square root of both sides. Take the square root of both sides. There you go. In other words, undo the thing that you did. And like I said, we're so familiar with this is that we don't even think twice about it. It's just like, well, you squared something, you unsquare it. You take the square root. And that gives you that square root y is equal to x. So I'm going to write that right here. I'm going to say the x outputs. Now we're thinking about this as outputs are equal to the square root of y, which we're thinking about in this case as inputs. But I wrote it like this to be even more suggestive, right? It's like, well, well, wait, this came from somewhere. That number right there came from somewhere, yes. It was originally the output of your original function. That's your y, a nine is your y. And so when you take that nine and plug it in, it tells you that you get, let's see. Well, without thinking about it, just if I just gave you this formula right here and I didn't say anything about this side, you would say, well, if nine is the Y, you would say then to plug it in and find the X value, I would just go take the square root of nine. Yeah. And it turns out that the square root of nine is indeed equal to three. Leave it alone. And so this thing right here, thinking about this as a function, it's like when four is your input, what do you do to it? Well, you take it and you just take the square root of it. And so we could write right up here, well, that's the square root of four. Yes, it is two, but how did you get it? You took four, and you took its square root. And that's why it showed up right there. Ditto with one. I could say, well, when one is my input, I have square root one is my output. 
Okay, so nothing new here. We're just kind of talking about but this I, function <laughs> and its inverse. And another thing we could do in, in, in the same in a similar manner, we could say, well, when you plug in a two, what does this tell you to do? Well, without using my brain, just using the symbols, this tells me that I plug in a two and I get two to the two. So my output is two to the two, which happens to equal four, right? Yes. Okay. Um, ditto with three. Plug in three, it tells me to take three and square it. And so we have three squared is the output of that. Finally, one, plug in a one, it tells you to square it. You get one squared is one. That's why it stayed put, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. These things are all, this is again, the exact same information. And if I wanted to, I could go through and write each one of these as I could say, well, this is one, this is one squared. This is four. This is the same thing as two squared, right? I'm just using this right here. This thing nine, well, that's the, that's the same thing as this. How did we get it? We took three and we squared. It. Okay, so there's three squared. Again, we could look at it this way and say, well, hold up. This is the square root of nine. Right? Like, let's just think about this. Like if I said, what is the, if the output of this function were nine, then the input would be, you'd say, well, what's the square root of nine? That's what you ask yourself, right? Like if I said X squared, the output is equal to nine, you'd say, well, Justin, take the square root of both sides. And so that's the, that X must have been the square root of nine, but you'd say, oh, it's three. But we could think about it as, yes, the square root of nine. If the output was four, what was the input? Well, the square root of four. And you can see like, yeah, that's exactly what all of this means, right? Like here, we're kind of thinking about this as the outputs of the inverse function. Does that make sense what I just said? Like right now we're thinking about these when I write them this way, it's like saying, well, this is the same thing we get if we started with this information and pushed it forward to get our square roots right there. Well, that's still the same thing right there. But now the thing is, and this is, this is where I think a lot of the confusion comes from, is you're used to this. And square root of nine is three. That's an easy one, right? But if I were to ask, well, let's say you plug some number into here and the output was a five. I'm asking you right now, what number did this come from? So in other words, you took some number X, you squared it and you got out a five. What was the input? I've, I've been muted. <laughs> um, the input is the square root of five. The square root of five, right? And we, we're used to thinking, now when you see that, right? We've trained our brains to look at this symbol and we know that it's a number. It's some number between two and three. It's like 2.107, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know about you, but somewhere in my mind, when I see this symbol, I know, okay, what this is, is some kind of two, blah, 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 like that. I know that that thing, these are easy. The square root of nine is just three. The square root of four is just two. But these guys, square root of five, it's somewhere in between, but I've learned after working with these for so long to know that this is just a symbol, which means you took some number, plugged it into this function, and then you pulled it back to find out where it came from. It's a number. And I see this thing as a number. So then when I see, for instance, an equation that says two root five minus minus 
three root five. It's like, oh yeah, two apples minus three apples is negative one apple. And I think about that thing as just a number. In case you can't tell, I'm really trying to drive a point home. And what I said earlier is that the notation that we're going to use for the inverse of, of exponential functions is wicked weird. It looks so weird that you forget that the symbol that represents it is just a number. And this is what I'm trying to drive home right now, is that we're going to have the same way as before when we're talking about some given function and its inverse, which is a function in and of itself, then we brought in this new weird notation to stand for the inputs to this thing. But the inputs to this thing are the outputs of this thing, isn't it? So when I originally asked you, you plug some number into here and you got a five, what you could have done is said, well, if five is on the output axis, I could look at the inverse function and say, well, then five is the input, isn't it? And what does this formula tell me to do to that input with y as the input? Well, it says take it and take its square root, just like we did with the other ones, right? It says when we plugged in a four, we took the square root of four. When I plugged in a nine, I took the square root of nine. When I plug in a five, I take the square root of five. And again, we think about that thing, that weird symbol as just some number. It's just a number. And it happens to be the number that lives right here between two and three. And that when you plug it into this function, out pops a five. Yes, you may have some crackers. And he's just like going through all the snacks and just pulling things up. So okay. any questions before we move on? I don't think so. Right? So all we've talked about, and this is like kind of by design, I'm showing you something that you've already seen a hundred times. You've, you've, without ever really, I don't know if we, in our class, if we ever drew this function, but you've been using it forever, right? And you know that, well, if I'm looking, if, the output of this is say a seven, and we want to know hmm, where did it come from? Well, that's the same thing as saying you took a number and squared it, x squared equals seven. And so then what did you do to both sides? You didn't really know what you were doing, but you're taking that and plugging it into the inverse function. You're saying, well, you told me take the square root of both sides, and that is what we're doing there. But what does that mean? It means you plug it into this function right here, the inverse function, the function that undoes what you just did. Before moving on, there's one more thing that will be really, really helpful in the future if we believe this right now. Look at the way I've written this. In this case, we took a three as an input, we plug it in and we get three squared. Okay. If I then took three squared and plugged it back into this, I get back a three. In other words, what am I saying? You take three and you square it. Then you take that number, plug it into the inverse function, which is the square root of it, and you end up where you started. Another way of thinking about this is we could take this number four, let's say, plug it into this function first and we get the square root of four. So I've taken a number four, I plug it into the inverse function and find its square root. Then if I take that, the square root of four and plug it back into the original function, we end up where we started. We take the square root of four and square it, it brings me back to four. And this is what we were talking about with the composition of inverses. If you take a number, put it into some function, 
And then you do the inverse of that thing. You end up where you started. Similarly, if you do that the other order, you start with some output, say four, and you find where it came from, two, and then you just put it right back in, well, you're gonna come right back to where you started, okay? So in symbols, I could take any X and square it, and then take the square root, and I should end back up at X. Notice we're talking about the positive values. This is the whole reason we have not talked about negative values is to forget for right now about that whole plus and minus situation, which just makes life a living hell. Similarly, I could take any number, oh, I don't know, let's call it y, take its square root, and then I square it, and I end up where I started at y. Any questions? think so okay so right and that's what this this means here right and at the very beginning i called this f of x and we said well then by the way we did this this is what we mean by the f f inverse it's the inverse of something and so what i'm doing right here is saying first do f to x take x and do f to it in other words, plug in f of x. That gives you, take your x, plug it in. It gives you some output f of x. And OK, so then f of x pops out somewhere right here. And then what we say is you take that number, plug it in to this function, the inverse function, f inverse. And we end up exactly where we started. And that was like one of the big takeaways from our, our class on inverse functions. And this is how it actually looks in this context where f is x squared. You do the squared first, then you do the inverse of it, and you get back to where you started. And that's what that means in symbols. Similarly, we could go in the opposite order. We could say, well, what if you took the inverse first? We had some value here on the y-axis. Let's call it y. You took it. Now you have square root of y. Sorry, that did not come out right, but who cares? You have the square root of y, which is what we call f inverse of y. Well, that's something. It lives over here f inverse of y. We take that and plug that into the original function, f of x, and we end up right back where we started. So we have some output for, we plug it into the inverse function, it takes us back to two, right? That's what that did right there. You plug a four into the inverse, and now that entire thing becomes the square root of four. Square root of four happens to be two, but that's the idea, right? Then we're going to push it forward by taking that value, which lives right there. We take it, plug it into our original function, and out pops, oh, the very thing that we started off with. And so this is a nice visual representation of what this stuff means in symbols. That is, when you compose a function with its inverse, it brings you back to where you started looks like a train wreck. Any questions before we move on to an actual exponential function? I don't think so. So now we're going to do the exact same thing, only with an exponential function. And the one I'd like to start with is f of x or y equals 2 to the x. And we should know how to graph these. It's 2 is bigger than 1. So every time you multiply it by itself, it's going to get bigger and bigger. So this thing should shoot up. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put one right here. We also know that if you plug in a zero, you get out a one. That's always the case with these, these guys. And that's nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw them like this. And just like before, let's get like four points on this. 
I would like this to be in your notes, just like we did before, right? You're also gonna draw a picture of this and flip it over and we're gonna do exactly what we did before. I plug in a one and I get out a two. I plug in a two, I get out a four. Only I also want to plug in a negative one. What do I get when I plug in a negative one? Uh, one second. Yep. yep. <laughs> X, Y. Negative one plus one. Uh, twelve. Oh, well. Mm -hmm. oh, well, well. All right, when you get a negative one, when you plug in a negative one. What is your output when x equals negative one? You get, uh, ouch, one half. One half, because the negative is taking into the denominator, make me positive. So yes, one half. OK, so I'm going to draw it like that. OK, copy this onto your sheet of paper. And we are going to invert this guy graphically. So, oh man. And just as before, make sure you've labeled your x axis, your positive x axis, your positive y. Okay, so this is the picture I got. It should be the same thing. Plug in a zero, get a one. Plug in a one, get a two. Plug in a two, you get a four. Plug in a negative one, you get a positive one half. Okay, now let's invert this guy. We are going to swap the role of X and Y. I want my old inputs to become outputs, my old outputs to become inputs. So I'm going to take X, put him where Y was, take Y, put him where X was, and I end up with this nifty little picture. Let's trace over. We get our positive y that way. Oops. And our positive x should be pointing up. Okay. Let's say one, two, negative one right there. Something like that. All right, let me know when you got this picture. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and draw it. So get the picture, make sure it looks like what I got. And then copy that in your notes as well. Let me know in a little bit. Oh. There we go. 
Okay. Okay. So at this point, oh, we're, we're, yeah, you can have it. That's yours, buddy. Crap. It's a crap. So <clears throat> we've recently introduced a new function, an exponential function. I don't think there's much to it, really. I mean, it's pretty self explanatory once you know what's going on. It's, you should have a good feel for this. And we've taken that. We've taken that, we've graphed it, and we said, well, this is a relationship between inputs X and outputs Y. What if I wanted to talk about the inverse game where the outputs are now inputs and the inputs are now outputs, and we end up with this picture right here. So, for instance, what I could do is something like this. Suppose... I gave you some number and you plugged it into this function and the output was four. What was the input? If the output is four, where did it come from? Uh, two. Two, right? That's what you would say. You would say, well, hold up. I took the number two, put some input value into it, not sure what it was, and the thing that I got out was a four. So you say to yourself, well, I know that two squared is four. Oh, it must have been, right? And you could think about this visually as, yes, when the output of this function is a four, then the input must have been a two. Here's a hard one. Here's one that's not on here. Let's say I gave you some number, you plugged it in and the output was eight. What was the input? So the output of this guy was eight. What must the input have been? Uh, three. Three, yes, yes. I would say when the input is three, right? That's what we'd say right here. When the input is three, then the output was eight. In case you haven't noticed, that's what we've been doing. We've been doing this very function just now. I said, when the output was four, what was the input? Well, that's the same thing as saying, when you plug four into this function, then the output must be two. If I plugged two into this function, the output would be one. But what does that mean? Well, that means that there was some output, two. And we know where it came from. Right, you took two, raised it to some power, and got out a two. What was that power? Well, you look at here, or you just think about it. You say, "Well, two raised to the first power is that?" Well, that's what this means. That's exactly what this means. Here's your output y that came from doing two x, two to the x. Here's your output y. So you take two and raise it to some input number, and you get out a y. And earlier I said, when you get out an eight, what was the input? Well, we just said, right? Like that's what we were solving right here. Only the problem is now the outputs are, are new inputs, right? And this is the idea of an inverse function, all right? So this is where, this is where everything kind of, so right now, do you feel pretty good about this? Yeah. Yeah, um, this is where it's all going to just get really ugly. <laughs> so we need a name for this function. And it has an, this function right here. And yeah, let's go. Well, let's talk about this. You'll notice that I used two to the X. I could have said three to the X. I could have said four to the X. I could have said A to the X. And half of those possibilities look exactly like this, right? That these functions, a to the x, go up like this. And therefore, their inverses are going to look like this. It will be a little different if it is a 
function that's smaller, and we're not going to really talk about this today. Don't really worry about this. But if it looked like that, you could draw this on your piece of paper, flip it over, and you would find that the inverse looks like this. Since this guy always goes through at one, notice what happened. One ended up right here, right? When the input was zero, the output was one. Therefore, doing that in the reverse order, when the input is one, the output is zero. Ditto right here. The input was zero, the output was one. The input was one, now the output is zero. So my point is that all every inverse function of a exponential function either looks like this or it looks like this. In the same way before, I said every single exponential function either looks like this or it looks like this. Well, therefore, every inverse function either looks like this or it looks like this. You really don't need to worry about this right now. Um, if we need to talk about it more, we will get into it. Right now, the picture that you should be building in your head is this connection right here. Okay. This is what the inverse of this thing looks like. So if I said this right here is some exponential function, of course, you know, it goes through one. And then let's say I said you plug in a one and you get out a seven and we wanted to know what does the inverse of it look like? You don't use your brain. You say, well, it's an upward facing one. So it looks like this. Easy. It used to be you plug in a zero, you get out a one. Now you plug in a one, get out a zero and you're just connecting these things in your brain like you did before. You said, okay, an upward facing one looks like that. Now it used to be you plug in a one, you get out a seven. And so now you plug in a seven, you get out a one. And that is what in general, these inverses look like. Now comes the ridiculous hard, the ridiculously hard part, which for some, you got all this. Can I erase this stuff down here? Yeah. Okay. Here comes, I don't know why it's so ridiculously hard, but this function has a name. We call it the logarithm. The problem, and it's abbreviated log. The problem is, like I said, this could have been two to the X. It could have been four to the X. It could have been 7.59 to the x. So we need some way of specifying the base. And what we do right here is we write log, and then we just write what the base is, and we write it really small, like that. So that would be log base 2. This is how you would say that. This is log base 2. And now what we've done is we have inputs and we have outputs. The inputs, in this case, We've, 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 we're going to, just like we did before, we're going to keep them named as Y right now, because I really want us to make this connection that you could only plug in old output. I can't take a negative number and plug it in here, right? Because if I tried to plug in a negative one, we would have said, well, negative one was the output of two to the X. No, it wasn't. That never happened. You can't do that. that that's not going to happen. So the range of this, you've already said, the range of this are the positive real numbers. And since these are now the inputs to this function, you could kind of see by the graph if we continued the graph on, you'd say, well, the only numbers I can plug in are the old output. So I could only plug in the range of the old one, which is from zero up to infinity, just looking at it graphically, like I was saying before. What values can I plug in? Well, which ones are defined here from zero to infinity? OK. Now, like I said, I want to keep this as y. So the inputs are y. So I'm going to write it like this. And we're going to say the outputs are x's like this. 
Now, yes, if we had renamed this with an X and a Y axis, then the inputs would be X and the outputs would be Y. But I really want us to link these things together because the only way you could plug a number into this function is if it is the output of this function. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Now you'll notice here, let's just really explicitly talk about these connections, what we did before. We said y equals x squared, and then we had, well, then that means that x equals square root y. And again, now this is what I'm talking about. Like we got into the habit of when we see something like this, we thought of it as some number. So if I took the square root of five, you'd say, oh yeah, that's just some number. Ditto right here. This is just some number. That's all it means in the same way that that was just some number. So if I took some input, let's say three and plugged it in, then this thing right here would be, I'm not going to use my brain. I'm just going to use what the function tells me to do. It says that I plug in a three, right? The three goes in here as inputs. And therefore, the output of this thing is log base two of three. And you say, what number is that? The same way like earlier we said, what number is the square root of five? Well, that doesn't matter. It's some number, and in the context, I could tell it was between two and three. This is just some number between one and two, and it has the property that when I take that number, because remember, this is just some number that's living between one and two, and this number, which lives somewhere between one and two, we're going to call it log base two of three, it has the property that when I plug it into this function, out pops a three, All right? That's, we're saying the same thing here as we did with the square root of five or whatever, right? It's that this is just a fancy way of writing this thing. They mean exactly the same thing. There is no difference between these two things. One just looks like it dropped out of some spaceship that came to invade the planet. This is, just looks terrible, but we really need to think about this as a function. I will make this note right now. Your book does not use parentheses here. It just writes stuff like this, log two, uh, four. It does not use parentheses. I am 100% against not using parentheses because what does this mean? Is that log base two of four plus one? Or is that log base two of four plus one? Uh, yeah, and so always, I'm gonna say just while you're learning this stuff, always, always, always use parentheses because we're thinking about this new crazy thing as a function. And we're gonna plug some number into a function and get something out. So the same way, like we don't usually write something like that. We would say, no, 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 two times root five, mm -hmm. right? because that's ambiguous. Same kind of thing with the parentheses there. Like your book just writes, log base two, four, and then it might go plus one. You're like, well, what? It's the same uh, kind of problem. <laughs> and so, you know, by convention, I usually write things on this side. By convention, I'm going to say, use parentheses. So there's no ambiguity. It will make your life so much easier if you just get in the habit of always using parentheses. Another reason why is because we have now been trained pretty well to think about the inputs of functions as the thing you throw into parentheses. So if your function looked like this, you'd say, oh yeah, whatever I do right here, 
I do right there. And we're thinking about that as an input to a function. Ditto right there. You want to think about this as the input to this function. Okay. And of course, inputs to this function are the outputs of this function. So let's let me let me try to trick you here. Hmm. What is log base two of eight? So let's break this apart. This is a function. The, that's the input. So that means that that input is somewhere on here. That input eight is the input. So we're over here somewhere. If I plug in an eight, what do I get out? Well, this is hard to think about, but we eight? could say, say again? Would the value just be eight? Well, no, because think about it. What this means is that your output is eight. But if the output here is eight, that I'm sorry, oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Eight. The input huh? to this function is eight. So that means, just remember what all of this means, that means that eight is the output of this function, which means that its input must have been what? Three. Three. And there you go. And so now this is one way of writing that. But what did we just say? Well, we just said that two to the three is equal to eight, right? And earlier, when I was doing all of this, I was saying, okay, suppose that two to, I gave you some number, two to some number equals, and then I wrote down an actual number like four. Well, this is how we thought about, and this is honestly how you're going to think about it when you start to do this stuff. The best way is to take a problem like this and translate it into something like this. So we'll, we'll do that in just a second. But here's the idea, right? Earlier, so you just, just look at this. What, is, what does x have to be here? Two. X has to be two, but we could put this into log form and say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and write this in logarithmic form. So I'm going to say, okay, log, the base here is two. And so I have to go two. And now I'm going to swap inputs and outputs. This is how I write this down when I go to translate from one to the other. I start with, okay, we're translating. So log, okay, base two, okay. I do the parentheses and write equals. And now I go, okay, I'm going to swap inputs and outputs. Input, the old input was X. So the new output is X. The old output was four. So the new input is four. And that's what this means right here. This number, and you already told me that X equals what? Three. I mean, two. Two, two, right? Because plug in a four, get out a two. And so again, this symbol is a fancy way of writing two in the same way that the square root of four was a fancy way of writing two, but we could still think about that as the input of a function. Or we could think about that entire thing as equaling some number. So should we also think about this right here? It's like, yes. Once you've actually plugged a number in, this thing represents some number in the same way as once you've plugged some number in, square root of four, it actually equals some number two. So what did we do last time? Uh, can I get rid of this stuff right here? We will have much more practice with this kind of stuff in the next section. Uh, but I want to introduce this to you right now. We're going to play with this a lot because it takes a long time to get a feel for this. But, so can I erase this stuff down here right now? Yep. Okay. So the other thing we did here, when we were doing this one earlier, I'm gonna get rid of the three for right now and the log two base three. We said that there are other ways of thinking about each one of these numbers. We could say, well, 
just by definition here, this number that you get out is the same thing as two to the one. This number, you take a two and plug it in, and that means that you get, well, two raised to the two. In this case, you take a three, you'll plug in a three, that's the same thing as two raised to the three. Now we add another one. This number right here, one half, is the same thing as two raised to the negative one. Or you could play this game over here. We could say, okay, log base two of something. So log base two of two, right? That's, I'm taking, a, that's my function. I take whatever input that is and plug it in. And that's what pops out. So this is log base two. My input was two. And in this case, my output was a one. Why? Well, because it used to be the case that when one was your input, your output was two. Do this for another one. How about four? Plug in a four into this function. And it looks like this log base two of four. And what pops out? Well, log base two of four. And that is just a fancy way of writing the number two. So it's just like before when we had over here with the square roots, we had a one and we could write that as a square root of one. You plug in a four and you write that as the square root of four. You plug in a 16, you write that as the square root of 16. We can say, but the square root of one is just one. The square root of four is just two. The square root of 16 is just four. It's the same thing that's going on over here. I'm saying there's two ways of thinking about this. And there's a nice equivalence here, right? I plug in a two, I get out log two base two. Log, log base two of two. But what was that? Well, that was one. And so they're equal in the same way that one is equal to the square root of one. Plug in a four, what do I get? Well, whatever log base two of four is. Same way here, plug in a four, what do you get? Well, whatever the square root of four is. But it has this property that when you plug that into the original function, right? When I plug two into the original function, I get out of four. And so this is how all of this stuff is connected. They're, we're saying the same thing, just with different notation. And so, now this is the last thing I did is, so we could think about it like this. And of course, if I wanted to, I could say this is the same thing as two to the zero. Two is the same thing as two to the one, right? Because that's how we got these in the first place. Remember, like we had to calculate the outputs of this function and that's how we got it. We just said, okay, when I plug in a two to the two, I get four. Plug in a two to the three and I get eight. And that's what all those guys are. Well, this is the same thing here. We could say, well, hold on. The output here was two. And so how do I get back? In other words, like how do I take a square root? Well, we don't write it as like square root anymore. We're, it's kind of like a exponential root. That's a good way of thinking about it. A logarithm is like an exponential root. If your output was two, then your input is just, well, log, in this case, base two of two. Your output was four, then your input was, well, whatever that is. If your output was eight, up here. Well, then you just take the log base two of eight. And that's how that comes back right there. So these are all, we've, we're saying the same thing, but now instead of one equals square root of one, four equals square root of two, we have one equals log base two of something, two equals log base two of something, three equals log base two of something. And so, Any questions for right now? This is pretty much all we wanted to get to today.
Oh, Peter, I wish you wouldn't be doing that. Any any questions? I don't think so. Okay. So your homework, we are going to get way into, and I think the very last thing I did was I took inputs and composed them. You know, I took an input, plugged it into here, then took that output and plugged it into here. And then, oh, lo and behold, we ended up at the same place. Then I did the same thing. I said, okay, well, we're gonna take four and plug it in. And then, oh, we get a two, take a two and plug it in. And oh, we get four. Same thing's gonna happen here. We're gonna get into that more next time. And I know this looks terrible, but I think, I think it's a good way of presenting it. Let's see. So what you're gonna need to know for tonight, or for the homework. Um, so graphing these things is exactly the same as everything we've ever been graphing up until now. So I'm gonna leave this side over here. You're not gonna have to graph any where the base is between zero and one. They're all gonna look like this, okay? So for instance, let's say we had to graph y equals log base five of x plus two. Okay. First off, this is the inverse of the graph what to the x? something y equals something to the x. What is that something? Think about the notation for that bad boy and that bad boy. Where does the base show up in the log notation? Um. Here, leave it alone, please. Leave it alone. Thank you. Thank you. Here, just leave it alone. Zero. Oh, no. So, point. Mm -mm. so there are, remember that this can be translated. I don't think I did this explicitly, but this means the exact same thing as y equals to the x. Remember, we swap inputs and outputs, and then we have to tell which base did it come from. And that is where we say where the base came from right there. Okay. So this thing, what is the base of that guy? Five. It's five. And so in other words, this thing right here, and I know I'm not going not gonna to do it. This means well it's almost because you have the x plus two we're not really going to worry about that but here's the idea you have some inputs into log base five and then some outputs yeah. all that means is that you this is a fancy way of talking about your original function which is y equals five raised to the x we know what that guy looks like he shoots up because five is bigger than one therefore it's inverse which is the thing you care about looks like that that's really any of any of these that's the same kind of reasoning that we're going to use we're going to say if they give me y equals log of 170 of x i'm going to say well that's a fancy way of saying that that is a fancy graph for y equals 170 raised to the x like that and 170 to the x, hey, lo and behold, he looks like that. He goes through here at one. Oh, and so when you flip him, he's going to look just like this. It's just that these numbers are going to be a little bit different, but it's still going to go through at one. And so the point, the, 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 the takeaway is this, that 
anytime you're trying to graph a log and the base is bigger than, excuse me, bigger than one, every single one of those things looks like this and it goes through here at one. The same way that I was saying, the takeaway from our last lecture is that if, if the base is bigger than one, it shoots up. If the base is less than one, it shoots down. This is kind of one of the big takeaways here is that if the base of a log is bigger than one, well, then it's gonna look like that. It's that easy. Used to be the case, if we're thinking about the original function, if this is five to the X, plug in a zero, you get out a one, plug in a one into five to the X, and what is my output? I'm sorry, would you say that again? Yeah, so this is my function because we're talking about log base five of stuff. And I'm saying, okay, this is related to this. And it used to be the case that this was five to the X. So I plug in a zero, I get out a one. That's a given, that's always the case. But in this case, when I plug in a one, I get out a what? Five? Five. Because five to the one is five. And so now I could get another point on this guy. I could say, okay, it used to be the case that one was my input, five was my output. Well, now it's just the reverse of that. Now when five is my input, one is my output. And you could see, like, literally all I did is I'm just taking this picture and flipping it over. This is, this is the same exact way of talking about this thing right here. It's a fancy way of talking about this. The same way that square root is a fancy way of talking about x squared. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we got two minutes left. Oh, man. Okay, so <laughs> therefore, what I've just said is that y equals log base five of x should look like this. It go should go through here at one. That would be log base five of x. And now if I add two to the input, what does that do to my graph? Uh, shifts it. Shifts it in which direction? The x-axis. Mm -hmm. Right or left? Would it be the left? because mm -hmm. inputs are backwards. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to take this shape and translate it two units to the left. So then one goes down to the zero, goes down to negative one. And that is what that guy should look like right there. Now, it used to be the case that the y-axis was where this thing gets closer and closer and never gets to. In other words, the y-axis was an asymptote. But now, since I've moved it two units, it's not negative one. It's got to be down at negative two. Does that make sense, right? I just shifted everything over two units. And so it's got to be approaching negative two, but it'll never actually get to negative two. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you follow what I was saying about the asymptote, why the asymptote has to be there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, and again, what does that mean, right? Like y equals log base five of x means like this is the same thing as saying you took five, raised it to some power y, and you got out some value of X, right? Like I'm swapping the roles of X and Y. My, into this function, my input is X, which means that it's the output of some function, five raised to some power equals X. That's my output now. And if you say like, well, if it's, 
less than negative two, even if it is negative two, right? Then you're saying, okay, you plug the negative two into there. You got negative two plus two is zero. And so now you're trying to plug a zero into here. And so you're saying five to what power gives you an output of zero? It doesn't, right? That's why we're not getting this, right? That's why it never goes over on this side. It doesn't make any sense, right? And so that's why the asymptote is where it is. And then when we shift this guy over, well, we're just kind of keeping track of that. Now it's okay to plug in a negative one because if you plugged in a negative one, you'd have negative one plus two. Well, that's just one. And so you're saying log base five of one equals what? In other words, five to what power equals one? Well, it's just zero. And yeah, lo and behold, that's the output right there. This is brain bending stuff I know and we're going to get more into this right now we're just going to focus on graphing you're going to have a bunch of these um actually just a couple of these but it's basically the same thing right is like is that base bigger than one if it is this thing shoots up like that then are we going to shift it one way or another okay well then just take that one point you know where it is shift it to wherever if you've shifted right or left, your asymptote is going to follow you by that much as well. So that's all there is to those types of problems. Um, finally, we got to talk about domain. So let's do this. Okay, can I get rid of all of this stuff? Uh, yeah. I was going to wait till next class to introduce this, but this might be helpful for you. Um, we're going to use this a lot. I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. If y is equal to a to the x, this means exactly the same thing as log base a of y equals x. Those mean exactly the same things. Here you took some number a and you raised it to some power x. And then, so like two to the fifth, and it gave you some output. In this case, it's 32. Then we could say, well, that's one way of writing this true statement. Another way of writing this true statement is to say log base two, of the output, which is 32, is equal to the old input, which is five. And so if you get caught up with anything, you could just take this, convert it back into that, and maybe it'll help help make it will help make help things make more, <laughs> hopefully. Um, okay. Another way, now I don't want us to get all hung up on X's and Y's here. In fact, a better way of thinking about this may be something like this. We have some base. We're not going to use the same base. We're just going to use some base B. We're going to raise that to the power of U, and the output that we get is V. Well, then, this means exactly the same thing as log base B, right? Now we're just gonna swap inputs and outputs. My old outputs were V, so those are my new inputs. My old inputs were U, so these are my new outputs. So for instance, if I have three to the, uh, yeah, let's just do three squared. What's three squared? Nine. Nine, thank you. I could say, well, that means exactly the same thing as log base something. Okay, so you identify, what's the base? What needs to go right here? Um, three. Three, what? Right. Now, what are my old outputs that are gonna become my new inputs? Uh, 
be so log base. Would you say that log base three? Yeah, you'd say log base three of uh, nine. Nine, right? Old outputs become the new inputs to that function, and then the old inputs are my new outputs, and so this is equal to what? Three. It's equal to what? What was my old? Oh, no, 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 two. Two, there we go. And so this is, you're going to use this extensively in the, in the coming week or so. Like this is, I just want to go ahead and throw that in there. Um, this is just definition, right? This is all we've done, right? We, we, we've done this already, right? We took a number, we drew a graph, y and x. Then we flipped the roles of them and said, oh, well, then when you plug the old thing in, you get out the previous thing. Like, it's just a really funky way of writing, okay? And so that may help with some homework. So finally, finally, with this in mind, let's talk about the domains of these guys. So it used to be the case, and we're going to think about any old one of these. Now let's think about the top one here. We have an x-axis and a y-axis, and we're taking the value y equals a to the x. And the way I've drawn it, a is some positive number. And you told me that the outputs, in other words, the range of this function, the, the possible outputs to this function are between what and what? Uh, zero and infinity. Mm -hmm. Can we include zero? No. No, no, we can't because you never get zero as an output. You'll never get there. I don't care how small you make X. It'll always be bigger than that. So we never actually get to zero. And so... Therefore, if, if all we're doing is just taking this and saying, okay, the input to log is the old output of exponent, well, then it's impossible to throw in a Z. We can never throw in a zero. That doesn't make any sense. Because if you tried to plug zero into here, let's just see what would happen if we tried log base a of zero equals x. What the heck does that mean? Oh, that's right. There's a, there's a nifty dual here. This means, this right here means the same thing as I took a, right? I took a and raised it to the power of the output. So I took a, raised it to the power of x. And the number I got when I did that, the output number that I got was in this case, a zero. No, you did not. This is impossible. That's all it means, right? Like you cannot plug something in that never came out in the first place. It, th does that make sense? Like. Do you see what I'm saying there that you cannot plug in a zero because zero is not an output of the first one? Yes. Yeah, because it's like saying, okay, you plug something in, you got a zero. What did it come from? It never did. Ditto here. If I say, okay, you plugged something into this function and you got out a negative five. I'd say, no, you never did. You can't get a negative five out of this function. So, Similarly, if I tried to plug in a negative five there, what that would mean is to say, well, you took some, you took A and raised it to some power and out came negative five. No, that's also impossible. That never happened. That's why I'm trying to talk over Elmo right now, but that's why the domain finally, the domain of log base A of X is equal to the positive ones. It has to be equal to the outputs of these guys. Does that make sense the way I said that? Yeah. 
And I hope that notation isn't really, I know that's that scary stuff right there, right? But we're thinking about this as a new function, just the inverse function, just like before. And if we think about this as the picture that we have, here, buddy, can I see that for a second? Thank you. Okay. And so if we just draw it like that, then the question becomes like, what if it's shifted or whatever, things like that. But what we could do in that case, so like here's one last example, and I will let you go, is if we had something like this, first off, let's do this. F of X equals, uh, how about X minus five? And we want to know what is the domain of f. What I would do right here is I would say, well, the domain are all allowable input values. And so I would look, I would look right here and think about what restrictions we'd have to have. And I'd say, I know that whatever goes into a square root, it has to be the case that whatever goes into the square root is bigger than or equal to zero. And so we would say, well, x minus five has to be bigger than or equal to zero. And so X would have to be bigger than or equal to five. And so I would say, okay, then my domain of F has to go from five up to infinity. Don't include infinity. Looks like in this case, we can include five. And this should just be review. You should, you, you follow me on that? Yep. So we're going to do the same thing with, logs. We're going to say, okay, f of x equals log, let's go base, uh, let's go seven, log base seven of 2x plus one. And we want to know what's the domain. And we know already that log base seven of something, well, it looks like this, Right? And so just like before, when I said whatever goes into a square root, that thing has to be bigger than or equal to zero. Well, now we're just thinking whatever goes into log has to be strictly bigger than zero. Does that make sense? Yep. And so now we're going to say, okay, whatever goes in the log has to be strictly bigger than zero. So we would say 2x plus 1 has to be strictly bigger than zero. And then we'd subtract a 1 from both sides to give me a 2x has to be strictly bigger than negative 1. So that x has to be strictly bigger than negative 1 half. And I would write that as negative 1 half up to infinity would be the domain of f like that. And I would like to see interval notation when you're doing these. Um, okay, so that's pretty much your homework. We are going to come. <laughs> yeah. Am I right or wrong? Does this notation not just give you a huge headache? The log base stuff. Yeah, it yeah, does. It does. And this is, I'm telling you, it's getting that down is the hardest thing. And it's, oh man. It's ridiculous. I know. I'm sorry, but this is this is so important. I can't, I can't even tell you how important it is. Okay. Um, homework chapter 12, section two. Yeah, we're still on section two. Page 525. It's gonna be. Yep, Third, number 13. Number 13 through 19, odd. Um, number 27. And Uh, yeah. 31 through 35. 
31 through 35, odd. And number 39. And on number 39, they give you an equation. And it's going to look something like this. So if I told you two to something is equal to two, you would know what power that has to be, right? Yes. What, what power would that have to be? One. It would have to be one. So if I had, say, a 2x minus one in there, I would say, oh, 2x minus one has to be one. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. If we had two raised to anything in the world and it equals one, what two to what power equals one? Um, zero. Two to the zero equals one. So you'd say, oh, so whatever goes in there has to equal zero. It's going to help you with 39. 